The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone, welcome to the Stoa. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> this is the Sense Maker in Residence series, uh, the Unmaster class with David Fuller, broadcasting in the Sense Making Web. Very last session of this series, and uh, I think this is the last session uh, for the Stoa of the the year, two thousand twenty. It's been quite a year. Um, so, how today is going to work? It's going to be an hour, about an hour today. Um, I'm going to take in David in a moment. He can kind of uh, set the, the parameters. Uh, but I think, Stephanie, uh, we're going to look at your um, your stuff, and then we're going to pivot to look at the STOA uh, and, uh, you know, the potential of the STOA. Uh, David's going to um, give me some advice, I think. <laughs> and uh, then we'll open it up for some questions. Uh, so I'm going to actually create, well, while I take in David, I'll create a Google Doc, and I'll put it in the chat so if anyone has any questions that, uh, that came alive throughout this whole series. You can just put that in the Google Doc uh, when I when I share it. Um, so that being said, David, how's it going? Good, good. Yeah, happy Christmas, everybody, and happy New Year. So this is the final session, and so if there's any. You can put questions into the chat, but if there's a, a particular question that you really want to have answered before we close the sessions, it'd be great if you could put it into the Google Doc that Peter's just put in or is putting into the chat. Um, and as Peter said, so we're going to, I, I asked if, if people would submit their projects and we went through Aaron's last time and Ellie's last time. We're going to come to Stephanie in a second. And then Peter, we, we thought it'd be quite good to, to talk about the STOA. And I think by, by extension, because we're talking about the, um, and I see sort of Rebel Wisdom and the STOA as sort of sibling projects very much. So I think when, when we talk about the STOA, we'll also, quite a lot of the advice that I would be giving to Peter, I'm also giving to myself. So, um, and a lot of the things that he's been thinking about or been doing on the store are things I've thought about myself with Rebel Wisdom. And um, yeah, we'd love to to also harvest whatever thoughts or ideas are in the are in the the um, community, the audience. Um, and also want to make sure that we don't close without addressing any kind of outstanding questions or thoughts or ideas that people have. So please do put those into the document and we'll come to the Q&A at the end. So we'll continue with the, the, the masterclass. Stephanie, so I, I had a look mostly, as I said, I had a look mostly at your reckonings project rather than deep reckonings. But I wonder if you could uh, just frame firstly reckonings and then maybe deep reckonings and we'll sort of maybe freestyle a little bit on that as well. But main, main, mainly reckonings, I think. Sure, 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 sure. And um, my internet is actually kind of unstable. Can folks hear me right now? Yeah, there seems to be Wi-Fi issues with Stephanie, and I think there's a lag, big lag on her end as well. Should we? Yeah. Wait she if she rejoins. Well, we could always um, pivot to the Stoa right now, and then uh, I'll put her in the waiting room a little. Bring her back in and maybe we can take her in near the end. Yeah. Any questions? There's a couple of questions in there. So maybe rather than come to the store and then have to uh, pause and go back to, to Stephanie, should we just should we riff on a couple of the questions that have been submitted already? Sure. So who it'd be good if you could put your name on the question because then we can ask you to to say it. whoever posted the first one a lot of dialogue on podcasts it begins would like to unmute themselves and give their question i like question two <laughs> i don't know if i want to read it out loud though <laughs> we could we could come to that at the end so who does anonymous iguana no so I'll, I'll read it out. 
I'd prefer it if whoever wrote it would read it out, but I can read it. A lot of dialogue on podcasts about articulating the problems within the sense making and media space. There's hundreds of projects currently working on solutions. How can those get coverage so collaborative support and action can be taken? Oh, don't prefer to be on camera. I didn't see that bit. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, it's a really good question. I've actually thought about whether it would be possible to, to find a Game B correspondent. I mean, Game B being the name uh, for this kind of emergent what's next kind of space. And maybe it shouldn't be framed as Game B, but very much um, I'd, I'd like to have to find someone who could almost be a reporter. That's one of the things that I'm thinking about with Rebel Wisdom going forward is, is it possible to have a roster of reporters, one of whom might be, okay, what's next? What, what, are, the, what are the projects that are working around the world? What are the uh, pieces that are um, trialing different ways of doing things, whether that's in agriculture, education or whatever? Um, that would be the issue with most of these projects from what, from my experience of having done films about them is it's they're often very worthy you kind of end up in like permaculture and kind of stuff that has a certain aesthetic and so there's then a question of how you make these how do you make something that people that you think people should watch into something that people want to watch and that's not as easy as as it sounds um so that's the question I would say is have, it's a good question. Are you aware of people who are doing this already that feels inspirational, feels interesting? Um, there's a guy, um, the League of Optimists, League of Pragmatic Optimists, uh, Lopo. Um, I can't remember the name of the guy, but he's written a couple of books that I actually found really interesting, really compelling. And they were about this kind of area. Each chapter was a different um, topic, effectively. It was a different sort of segment, like education to um, agriculture to whatever. Um, if anyone can just quickly Google the name, like Lo League of Pragmatic Optimists, and see if you can find the guy's name, that'd be really useful. So the League of Pragmatic Optimists came off the back of the book that he wrote, or the several books that he wrote. And that's the kind of area I think is, like he was sort of game B before game B was a thing. Um, but I'd, I'd be interested in doing that. I'd be interested in finding someone who, who was deep in this, this environment and also was able to talk about point to real world projects in a way that kind of felt exciting and interesting rather than a turn off because there is that element you've got to kind of think about at the same time. Um, Stephanie, you're back. Are you, are you back in a sustainable way? I'm back in a sustainable way. Sorry about that. Would you like yes. to pick up with the, your pitch for, for sure, Reckonings? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'll just give a quick intro to Reckonings and Deep Reckonings. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. Um, yeah, so Reckonings. So Reckonings is a podcast that explores how we change. So every episode tells the story of someone who made some kind of a transformation from, you know, a deeply conservative congressman who made um, what he would call a spiritual conversion on climate change all the way to you know a, a white supremacist who managed to transcend a life of hate all the way to the um, the architect of Facebook's business model who um, realized he was addicted to his phone and had a reckoning and has since devoted his life to tackling technology addiction those of you who saw the social dilemma may know him his name is Tim Kendall so, um, so yeah, it's been a diverse cast of characters, you could say, but the through line is really just an exploration of, of, of the question, you know, how do people change? And how do people change in ways that connect to or scale into broader social and political change? Or more simply, what is the relationship between personal and social change? Um, so the two, yeah, the two intentions of the show are really to kind of explore and celebrate our human potential for transformation and also and this is this wasn't an original intention but this is kind of what happened just by virtue of producing the show is is to make critical self-reflection look stunning you know so that so that we are moved to do it and our public figures are moved to do it and we actually make more room for ourselves to 
learn and grow and, and change you know, in public. Um, and since, and, and then now just to give a little brief intro to Deep Reckonings, you know, since the, the early days of the show, I've, I've had kind of a wish list of guests of, of people who, who I thought their personal transformations would, would um, be most likely to translate into or scale into broad-based social change. So I'm thinking someone like Charles Koch, right? If Charles Koch had some kind of a crisis of conscience, it would literally change the climate trajectory of the planet. And so I was kind of fantasizing about um, making, I didn't even know what it was. It was like I, I, uh, some kind of synthetic film about Charles Koch's personal reckoning and how it ended up changing the world. And then I discovered the phenomenon of deep fakes, which for those of you who don't know what a deep fake is, basically fake video, video that, make it, that can make it look like people are saying and doing things that they never said or did. Most of most deep fakes are used for nefarious purposes. 96% um, of deep fakes online are involuntary porn, um, sticking someone's face into a movie they never acted in. Um, but for me, it was, the, I was, it, it was like, wow, you could actually do this. You could actually make this film, you know, or, you know, about Charles Koch's personal transformation and how it ended up changing the world. So um, Deep Reckonings basically takes, it is a series of deep fakes that take reckonings in a fictional direction. It is, it is absolutely explicit that these videos are fake, partly because I'm not interested in deceiving anybody, but partly because that is, that is kind of part of the power of the, of the medium is that you can know that it's fake and it still influences you. So this is Mark Zuckerberg, Brett Kavanaugh, Alex Jones, and most recently, Donald Trump having a reckoning. And, uh, and the question that I'm exploring with this project is, you know, how might we use our synthetic selves to elicit our better angels? Um, there's a lot more I can say about reckonings and deep reckonings, but I actually really want to, and, and some of you might actually be familiar with deep reckonings already. I did a, 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 a provocation here on the STOA, but um, yeah, and I can probably say more about where, where I'm envisioning each of these projects going, but for now, I'm just going to hand it back to David because, um, yeah, I'd really love to hear from you. Awesome. So I, I, I just sent the link of the episode that I listened to, um, not the whole thing, but I did listen to, I, I listened to sort of the beginning and then, and then kind of flipped through and heard uh, parts of the rest of it. Um, I mean, the first thing I'd say, I mean, there's a, there is a Wait, through. Sorry, thing. which, I don't, I don't see it in the chat. So which one? Oh, so we're one? going, I think Peter was going to share screen. Yeah. Oh, oh right. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. The, the one you just mentioned about Facebook's business model. Tim Kendall. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, first thing I'd say about the, I, I really like the, the framing of it. Like you've, we've talked about this a, a few times before and I, I think, I think it's bang on in terms of thinking about what would be required. Like we need a culture of we need a culture of people being able to admit mistakes and then some kind of um, what do you call it? Not reconciliation, but um, um, not restitution either. What's the other word beginning with R? I'm redemption. Sorry. Redemption, exactly. A culture of, of redemption in public. Um, and so I think the the the, the, the idea is really solid. And when you talk about it, I, I, it, it really makes sense. There's a real passion. There's a real um, sense of like, you, you build the blocks of why it's necessary really, really well. And what I was struck by, because you taught, you described some of these episodes to me before we listened to, to them, but I was struck by how much better I felt you, you've done that when we've talked than when I listened to the, the episode. When I listen to it, and also like even the even the artwork, the sort of the kind of fairly generic wool thing going on at the top, like th there's a there's a depth and there's a kind of like part of I think what makes this because I don't think people grasp what you're trying to do and what it is immediately. So I think you like this is one of those things we talked about like signposting. I think the signposting of this is really important. And when I was listening to the episode. I didn't feel that signposting at the beginning of the episode either, like explaining what we're going. I mean, I've, I've said this before, like the perfect, the perfect structure is tell people what they're going to hear 
tell them, tell it to them and then tell them what they've heard. I didn't feel that I got that with listening to this episode. I didn't get, and I would really have benefited from like, what is the, what is the key moment? What is the key phrase that he says that I realized that I'd done this or I realized that I'd been, I'd been mistaken or whatever that key moment is. I think with an episode like this, I'd love to hear it at the beginning. And I'd, I'd love to hear an, a narrative of um, this guy, I can't see his name here, where is it? Um, uh, t t uh, Tim Kendall. Tim Kendall. Yeah. So yeah. Tim Kendall was deep in Silicon Valley. He was responsible as much as anyone. He was sitting next to Mark Zuckerberg, little clip. I was sitting next to Mark Zuckerberg when blah, blah, blah. Right. But then, but then he realized that he was part of the problem and then some kind of soundbite from him. And you've, that for me is a tease. Like that's a tease at the beginning of an episode that then makes me want to keep listening. I, I, I heard, I've heard you explain what this episode is about far better than I heard it on the episode itself. Huh. Um, and I, I think this sort of, this need for signposting where, where we're at and what we're listening to and where we're, why it's significant to listen to this before we've established, like I've said this before, like I think while we're, while we're building an audience, we really have to do a lot, a lot of work to explain to the, the listener why something's significant and why we should be continuing to listen and, and to, to really, to sell, to sell why it's significant. And I think you probably have, even if it feels repetitive, I think you're probably gonna need to do that with every episode, maybe in a slightly different way. Like why is, why is a reckoning so hard? Why is it so important? And how would it change society if we were able to do that? Which you do really well. But I, I just, when I was listening to this, I didn't get that same sense from, from the structure of, of the episode. And I, mm -hmm. I also think like, there's some, I don't know what the artwork is, but, but there's some kind of sense of psychological depth that I'd be looking for from I guess you're nodding to kind of I don't know storylines or weaving of storylines maybe with the with the wool at the top, but I think there's I, I don't know I mean there's something that I'd want to get from the artwork of of I mean I'm thinking of the the kind of Rodan's thinker almost but really? that's that's not right but that I of, wanted to make the, something that was a psychological depth yeah yeah yeah. Uh, the, the the concept was actually a heart inside of the head, like a heart of the brain or something like that. Um, but I'm not a, I'm not a visual artist, but um, yes, I like the, I like the Rodin idea. Mm. And check my notes. Mm. Yeah, I think that that was the main because I think it's I think they're good ideas and I think they're I mean that the issue that comes up for me with the deep reckonings is you're choosing very you're choosing sort of real hot culture war figures for this and I think I think that has a, the chance of I think my sense is it's only going to be really shared by one side like that there's like Trump being such a polarizing figure you, you you know what people are going to kind of think about it already like they're they're very if you're looking to model if you're looking to shift kind of people who are on the fence I don't think though I don't think that sort of Trump or Kavanaugh like people are so are so wedded to their particular kind of narratives around those figures already that if if what you're wanting to do is to actually shift people I think that's I think it's difficult I don't I, I don't see I don't see that that's likely to happen with those with those figures um, and I guess the, the key thing with that is then trying to find an audience and get it into a sort of shareable um, shareable environment which which I guess is kind of Facebook groups and um, but I, but I think you're, I think you explain what it's about really well. So I would, I, I generally go for a lot of signposting about what you're trying to achieve, even with reckonings as well. Like 
um, which I think you 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 have done from the ones that I that I sorry the deep reckonings from what I remember watching. Um, so that that would be that was what came up mostly was sort of listening to that episode and just thinking about the the sequencing and the signposting of it more than anything. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's kind of this tension in narrative storytelling about you know like I I totally get the tell them what you're going to tell them tell them and then tell them that you told them but within within storytelling there's also a kind of attention around like really wanting to leave it up to the audience and not be too explicit but I think I think actually what you're suggesting makes more sense because I have I have I have more of an agenda here the agenda isn't just like listen to a story and get lost in it and just like have your own experience. It's like actually learn something, right? It's like, how do people change? Like this is, this is, I mean, it's not a scientific investigation by any stretch, but it's an investigation. So, you know, to the extent that I can, I can like elevate more of what is being learned. I, I, I agree that that would be worthwhile. Um, there's one, there's one other thing that comes up. Um, we should probably pivot fairly soon if we've, we've, only got an hour if we uh, go to the store in a second. One thing I was going to say, someone mentioned in the in the chat, I think Tom Oliver mentioned Cassie J modeling this in the red yeah. pill. That's the red pill, yeah. Like so far, what I've seen from your um your case studies or your um the characters you've chosen, they're mostly people kind of on the right or on on the sort of conspiratorial side who are having a reckoning and moving more towards the mainstream. I would, I would be interested in, like Cassie J is a good example. I actually did an interview with, so I watched the red pill and I was a little bit suspicious about how pat, how sort of neat the narrative was. Oh, I wanted to make a film exposing these men's rights activists. And then I realized that they were right about some things and I've given up being a feminist. And I, I was a little bit suspicious. So that was the whole, tone of my interview with Cassie was sort of digging into that and trying to, to kind of work out whether it was a um, yeah whether it was true or whether it was a kind of artificial narrative for the, to make the documentary and actually believe I actually believed that it was I also met Warren Farrell and kind of asked him about the process that she went through as well that for me is really interesting like people like I'd love to see a couple of examples from the other side like people starting to question some aspects of the woke narrative, for example, um, as a balance to that. Yeah, and there are, um, yeah, and certainly the, uh, there are changes from right, to, you know, the kind of change I'm interested in is not right to left or left to right. It's, it's from, you know, dogma to ideological liberty, right, from being fearfully attached to my views to feeling free to reflect on them and be critical of them and, and, and consciously change them to adapt to the reality around me. So there are, there are people who've gone in a, you know, I mean, the conservatives who've been on the show didn't even, it's, I mean, maybe some of them became more, it's, it's, been, it's been all of the above. I mean, certainly there's, well, I, I have actually another question I wanna ask you, but yeah, I actually should watch the red pill again. Um, as a source of inspiration. But I'm gonna ask you one, one last question so that we can then um, move on. So yeah, I mean, the, and, and the, you know, the ultimate aspiration for reckonings is to become somewhat of a, somewhat of a public confessional, you know, like the, the place where Louis CK and Mark Zuckerberg, you know, and, and Jordan Peterson, Brian Rose, like the place where people can can go when they're ready to take a look in the mirror and 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 grow from what they see. And and yes, in a public way, because part of what reckonings does is make is is like do that responsibly and do that beautifully and like really take care of that process. Um, short of that, you know, the hope is for reckonings to you know f find a home, like find a like get picked up by a bigger platform that can really invest in the show and the, and and like get more cadence and grow the audience and really kind of take off and I thought I thought this would kind of have been like a no-brainer for more newsy platforms like the Atlantic and Vox you know these stories are evergreen and they get into the biggest issues of our time you know it's like climate change violent extremism big tech it's like these are the biggest issues but you know get into them in a way that is 
that is hopeful and transcendent and 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 like and like shows us a way through and so I guess the question I have is is like I mean do you see potential here should I keep trying to find a home for the show and like and like you know incorporate these kinds of changes and we, we've talked about maybe turning it into a video series you know and are, are there potential homes you might think of you know or is it maybe time to to like put the show to bed and you know and move up move on to other other content in the pipeline whether it's deep reckonings as a series or something else i yeah. think, i think you need a big name or some kind of breakout episode if you want to get the attention of those platforms i think it's a really good idea the problem i see is that most most like really high profile people who have a moment that they kind of they kind of want to recant some prior position or they have a sort of confession to make there's a lot of places they can go and it's difficult for you to establish yourself as the place that they will go without right. putting yourself on the map in some way like ev every you don't necessarily everyone need wants to talk to jordan peterson about his yeah yeah like or joe joe rogan or someone else will have like if someone has a something that they really want to get off their chest and they know that it's yeah. obvious and they know the value of what they're about to say right quite a lot of podcasts high profile podcasts that they could go on and right. that's a great story in its own right right like, i think right. My, if my only value add is like i'll do it more responsibly and more you know beautifully like that might be a tough sell because often what you're looking for is the the the, the megaphone, right? You want to share this with the world, so yeah. Yeah, my sense is that you need to put yourself on the map a little bit more first before you might get taken up by one of those like bigger organizations. I do think that there could be a place for it. I think you still need to prove that sort of strength of concept and that there's enough. Um, like e either you're getting big names or you're finding people who others are not interviewing and then it's the strength of the storytelling and the strength of the journey and the strength of the and that's why that sort of sense of I think that's why I came back to sort of what my feedback was very much about the storytelling because I think you you're going to have to structure something out of um you're going to have to structure the storytelling in a way that makes it compelling and I think I think you're I think you have the potential to do that because when you describe the project to me, it's, it sounds interesting. It sounds some, like something that is necessary. So I do think that there's still something there. I just, I, I, I don't think if I'm, if I'm wearing my kind of editorial commissioning editor kind of hat, then I, I, I would say that it's not yet proven as a, as a concept or as a um, something that I would invest in or, or, or want to kind of give a home to. That's what I would say. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Cool. So we're going to shift to Peter. You'd wanted to bring a project that you've got called uh, the Stoat. Is it? Uh, it's the Stoa. That's that's the project. Yeah. And and apparently you don't like the name, the Stoa. <laughs> that's the rumors on the on the streets. <laughs> We, yeah, we might have had this conversation. The Stoat. I think you should change it to the Stoat. I think that would go really well. Yeah, a little no. bit more, little bit more. Yeah, kind of random situationist. Hmm. Hmm. I'll sleep on it. Yeah. Do you want to? I mean, do, do you want to introduce? Like, what is the Stoat? It sounds interesting. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe uh, the the frame that we went into this, like before this conversation was. Um, cause you're coming in with sort of advice, not knowing the full picture of what's going on with me or what's going on with the stuff internally here. But, uh, like if you were to give your thoughts on the STOA, like, um, what is doing right, what is doing wrong, what it should be doing, um, what would you do? Uh, so that was sort of like a, the theoretical we would go into. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so obviously we, we're kind of in touch quite a lot so I'm sort of maybe not as completely up on your thinking and so obviously take all of this with a pinch of salt but I thought I'd kind of come in with a, a the frame is sort of what I 
what I might suggest, what I might do if you kind of gave it to me and said, look, okay, look after it or um, do, yeah, sort of, so, so I, I'm not necessarily saying this is what you should do because you've got a certain, you've thought very deeply about this. You've got a certain kind of aesthetic and a certain yeah. kind of direction to it. I mean, what I would say, like just sort of free form um, riffing, I really like, like I think that you've, you've pivoted to this online world in a really interesting way. Like um, for, for me with, I'm still trying to work out what to do in this new environment. Like I kind of based Rebel Wisdom on um, production values effectively. Like I very rarely had just Zoom interviews for most of the beginning of Rebel Wisdom. It's sort of, no, let's make proper artifacts. Let's kind of go there, do the filming, et cetera. And I think I really love the model of iterating quickly, bringing in lots of new people. And I, I love the way as well that you've kind of thought about kind of different mimetic tribes and this sort of sense of a place that can hold them all. And I think I, I've tried to make Rebel Wisdom as, as kind of open as possible in terms of, um, but, but it has a perspective. I mean, Rebel Wisdom has a perspective in a way that I feel like the Stoa doesn't or is able to, ho to host multiple perspectives. And I think that's really, I think that's really well done. And that sort of, you've talked about the Switzerland, the culture war. And I think that it feels like it has that potential. And I feel like something like that is needed. Um, and I know that your current thought is, is probably to sort of shift and do fewer events maybe. Um, and I think, I think that space where there is a place that you can go if there are things that need to be discussed or things that need to be resolved, like that's really, really needed. And I think that that within this sort of broader sense-making web or meta web, I think that's always gonna be needed. And I I'd kind of thought in the past, like what are the outstanding, so the, these are the things that I would I would suggest, and it sounds like you're you're kind of moving in that direction anyway, editorially, a little bit more thought about like what are the specific questions like what are the specific outstanding questions where are things getting held up what are the important sort of dialogues I'd love to see more dialogues I think at the moment it sort of seems like there's mostly it's mostly people coming in and presenting their ideas in a, in a sort of um, uh, a kind of stream of consciousness or a sort of one-on-one -on -one kind of way with with obviously a questioner a presenter I'd love to see more events around like what are the specific questions in this particular area like you know the sort of Sam Harris Jordan Peterson idea like there was this sense a couple of years ago that oh wow they're going to really hash it out in public and we might make some progress on some of these big questions in the culture and that never really got anywhere there was this sense of um at the time where they where they were doing a lot of these big imp big public events something I thought because we actually pitched um, initially to start doing some of those big, big in-person events. And what I thought of doing was, can you make a, a film, a framing film before, so you have a Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson or whatever, um, but you make a film ahead of time, just framing the conversation. It's like, they've said this, they've said this, they've had this conversation, they've had this conversation. These are the outstanding questions. And so a 20 minute film that everyone's watched before you come to the debate, like, is there a way of setting things up? So like you're not going over old ground again and again, and you get some sense of progression towards something. Is there a way of combining kind of memory? You've also got the potential of like, you've also done all of these events in the past. Maybe there's stuff that questions that have been raised in previous STOA sessions that someone, and I think you've got a lot of goodwill behind the, the project as well, the way that you've run it, like it's involved, it's got a sort of sense of community. I think there's a way that you could probably kind of put out there, could someone set up, okay, we've got this conversation, could someone set up clips from this, from this piece, from this piece, from this piece, and then you've got a kind of, this sort of idea of like, you, you talked about doing seminars before, could there be a seminar about a particular topic with say three or four people? And then you, you get someone, say it's Brett Weinstein and I don't know, whatever. 
So someone could go back through Brett's previous pieces and like he said this in the past, he said this in the past, uh, this other person said this in the past. This is like you've set up the conversation and then you've kind of guaranteed that they're hopefully going to go into new territory because you've already kind of recapped what their positions have been in the past. Um, so that's sort of sense of a space for resolution or space for, for actually progressing the conversation forward. That seems necessary. And there aren't that many places when I think of it that have that, um, have positioned themselves well enough to have kudos and clout on all sides of the spectrum. And I think that's something that I kind of thought about or toyed with as something that Rebel Wisdom could do. And a lot of, like I said, a lot of the things that I'm kind of coming up with, they're things that I've thought about, but I think someone should be doing this. So it could be Rebel Wisdom, it could be the Stoat, it could be somewhere else. Um, I, I think it also kind of, the other interesting thing with, with the growth of the Stoa for me is it kind of highlights what in this new a in this new world of kind of mainly online what is rebel wisdom meant to be doing like what is the journalistic because it's not now it's not now highlighting just having interviews with people and letting them kind of reveal their thinking like there has to be something more to it and i get the feeling that's maybe where you're at as well like there has to be something more than just just a place for people to come and to share their ideas like there has to be a, a, a something something more some kind of more interesting cross-pollination or sense of moving things forward on on some level um and that's certainly where i feel where i feel drawn with with rebel wisdom um i would say sort of if you're going to do that like those the things that we talked about a lot like signposting and I, I sense a kind of tension when I, when I talk about these things because I think you've got a um, you're you've got a kind of lo-fi aesthetic that I think works to some degree um, I would advise being very deliberate about your strands like if you're going to have different strands of content to have some kind of aesthetic around each of those different strands. Like if there's a different potential sort of different intro to, to the film or a different way of framing the experience for each of the strands. So there's an aesthetic to it. And then, um, yeah, for the films that go up afterwards where there's a different graphic that can intro it. I, if, if people want to have a look, we've just put out a new strand that Ali has launched called Decoding Culture. So it's a conversation between, so Ali's ho hosting it, and then it's a conversation between Jonathan Pajot and Jules Evans about new religions. And so that's kind of the strand, that, that's what I mean about having a strand. So we've got a new graphic at the beginning, Decoding Culture, like it's clearly signposted, okay, this is a different kind of uh, conversation or it's a different uh, kind of film. Um, I would, I would change the name because I think that it's grown beyond the stoicism frame. And I would also change the music. Um, my scent, I know that, I think we talked about this at the time, like the music is um, a, a piece that you really love. I feel like it's not quite an intro piece. It feels like it's a fragment of something that if I haven't heard the song, I don't quite know where it's going or what it is. And I think that there's there's a kind of, um, yeah, for me, it doesn't really work as a, as a piece of intro music. And that's, that's probably the most dangerous thing that I might say uh, during the session. Um, and, and the intro music is the, uh, the videos you're, you're saying. Yeah, on the video. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like it's a, it's a track you really love and you wanted to play it because it's a track you really love, but unless, I know the track. I don't think I, I get it. It doesn't feel like it's, it doesn't feel like an intro piece to me. Um, and I, yeah, I, I think we've talked about this before as well. Like for me, the Stoa is, 
you've got it, it's a difficult one now because it depends whether you've got enough name recognition as the stoa that it's already got a persona and we've talked about that actually stoicism has a certain cachet as well but i think that it has i think what you've built now has a bigger frame than that and i for me it it, it pigeonholes it as a certain thing it has a it has a certain feeling of and i also think it's slightly more playful i think it's got a more playful energy that i don't think is reflected at the moment in the in the framing like it feels quite serious like marcus aurelius stoicism like it it, it feels like it I, and you have that side to your character like you can be serious but you also have a playful deconstructive side that i think doesn't necessarily come through in the aesthetics of it um the daemon shows that yeah you can always say it's it's true it's hard to get the balance of like what is chosen by the daemon and what is chosen by what um, i promised i won't play the daemon card in this the rest of the session so you can you can rest assured with that what if the daemon says that he wants to play the daemon card <laughs> they were fucked <laughs> yeah um that would be the main I think that would be the main thing for me is to lean into what is the piece that I I would say if you if you could, and I know it's really difficult to kind of take yourself out as a um, as a bottleneck. Is there a way of spinning off the spinning off the regular events so they kind of keep going but they're run by by others within some kind of broader umbrella and is there something that you could launch can you think about umbrellaizing like is the stoa one brand within a kind of catalog of different strong brands or strong i mean the word brand kind of rubs some people up the wrong way but just there's not really an alternative to it and i don't have a problem with that a strong identity like it does have a strong identity and I'd start thinking about, are there different strong identities like Gold and Shadow being one within it? Um, like, are there specific, can you, can you have like an umbrella hosting of different strong identities within that that then start becoming um, cross-pollinating with each other that you then are allowed, then other people can, can own their particular brand within it. And you have, like the Stoa becomes the place that has these sort of big set piece events every month or whatever that then kind of have um, a certain question that they're answering or they're addressing that you can then have, as I suggested, maybe kind of a setup and um, yeah, so they then become a kind of artifact of having addressed that question as well. So you've then, then I think the, the, the graphics and the aesthetics for if you're putting that kind of energy and effort into creating each of those online events, I do think that that then the aesthetics of how it's presented and how it's how it's um, framed afterwards start becoming more important, um, which is something that can be done relatively cheaply. Like I don't think I don't think you need to invest a lot of money into into it, but you do need to invest a bit of energy, time, framing, and thought into how it's how it's aesthetically presented. That's that's my long rant. And um, given that we have 15 minutes, how do you think we should proceed? Maybe me share my thoughts or we take the, some thoughts or questions from the, the people in the room? Because I can stoically be silent all day. <laughs> Are there any questions you want to riff on the chat? We did ask people to see. I mean, do you want to respond to, to any of that? Have you got any thoughts that, that came out of? Yeah. Um, first, I, I'm, I'm definitely not attached to any of the aesthetics or the music that is associated with um, the Stoa. Uh, and so when a pivot feels right, then I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, with the name itself, uh, I quite like it. and. You, you have been the only one that, that said you didn't like it, uh, to be honest. And I, I suspect the, 
there's this whole thing called the modern stoicism movement. Uh, it's like a mimetic tribe that just talks about stoicism. And I think they're quite pissed off at me that I just <laughs> boldly took the name the Stoa and then have this place that's not even about stoicism. Uh, and they don't, they don't come to the Stoa anyways. There's like, you know, I, I can list them off, but even though I'm embedded in that community. Uh, but conceptually, it feels quite rich because the Stoa was, the original Stoa Bukele was never about stoicism. It was about an uh, open meeting place where philosophers came, you know, people came to talk about their ideas, artists. Um, and then it just happened, a bunch of philosophers sat on the porch they were called the Stoics. Um, so I kind of quite like it that a practicing Stoic like myself is having a place called the Stoa that's not about Stoicism. Um, and, and most people seem to kind of get it who come here. Um, and, I, and, I, and I've already switched. It used to be I had this podcast called Intellectual Explorers Club and an in-person meeting group called that. And I switched it to the Stoa. Um, so it just feels like I don't want to do another rebranding. Um, so that's that. The thing that made me feel most alive what you're talking about is finding the intersection of what excites me with what sort of the world needs, you know, and I can't do too much. Um, but having these really great conversations between people who are not talking uh, is quite important. And my Reese, my uh, my previous thinking was having the frame like an anti-debate or, or something kind of like a cutesy that could attract people in, but I don't think that's going to work. I think that's just going to like set up a beacon to fail because uh, then people are going to just uh, build kind of like a medic immunity around that. Like, oh, they're trying to trick us or something. Um, and I think what the Stoa has done quite well, thanks to my ability, my interpersonal kind of talent stack and my culture war meta perspective is to play this long game where I can invite all these different people to come into the same space from contra points to fucking like Alexander Dugan. And then they get uh, um, comfortable around this digital campfire and then phase two is to bring them into conversation not under this frame of debate or even this anti-debate but just have a conversation and some of these conversations are we're, we're getting more into these kind of round table conversations um on monday like jordan hall richard bartlett Nora bates and they were in conversation uh for the first time uh and so i like this idea of of having these different conversations of people and cross pollinating these ideas that would have not happened before uh, because they trust me and they trust this place called the Stoa that seems has like you can't really pattern match what it is in the, in the, in the culture war. Um, so that quite excites me that that project and I don't know how it would shake up. And then I guess that this cap everything because um, it's like you said this this project was created in like sort of a spiritual emergency for me and then it was based on the foundation of a gift economy. I'm like this is my gift to the world and you can provide a gift back. And I feel like at this time, like I have to just inhale and just see what I want, kind of shed some expectations, shed like a lot of work, and then maybe just have it resting in potential and to figure out what, what it wants and then kind of scale back up. Um, so there's definitely a feeling that I need to just kind of scale down and figure out what really I want and then what, what, what most value can I offer with this particular project. And, and then I'll say this, if, if, if I'm going to pivot to the market economy under this umbrella, and that's going to take a lot of, um, you know, the character is going to be different because it's going to turn into contractual relation to, compared to like, say, dare I say, demonic relating. Um, and, uh, and maybe there could be different components it could be bifurcated. One could still maintain the gift economy, one could be in the market economy, but all that really needs to be thought out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wasn't necessarily suggesting a market economy model uh, certainly if you're going to do fewer events um, and I don't I don't think you I don't think you could shift to a market economy model if you're I mean basically if you are going to get there, there's, there's a dynamic here as well which I've kind of been aware of is which is to find people who are really able to go into new dialogic spaces it's actually quite rare and, and generally people who've kind of established themselves with a perspective the more high profile someone is the less able they seem to be to go into kind of new territory but if you are able to find those people and kind of create a, a, a model for that kind of dialogue that was more interesting more kind of generative more cool and you could and people would then push themselves out of the comfort zone. I mean, if you're going to go for for higher profile names, which I think 
I think it's possible because I don't think there's anywhere else that's trying it really in this, in this way, then I don't think you could do that as a market economy model. Because I, like these people, once you start getting up to the kind of the really big names, you can't afford them anyway. So they either, basically that anyone who's kind of got a big name will either do something for free or for a lot of money. And I think the opportunity of creating something where people, like that's one of the, like we kind of pivot, Rebel Wisdom kind of pivoted from uh, mainly kind of Patreon style to actually uh, a kind of market economy model. And that feels, it feels different. Like it feels, so we've got a model where, for example, we're paying all of our facilitators. We've made a kind of decision to do that, but it's, it's, it felt a little bit more freeing in many ways when, when it wasn't a market economy and where it wasn't kind of a relationship of kind of providing services and um, like there, there was a different feel to it. And I wouldn't, I would definitely wouldn't advise going away from that because I think it's quite crucial for what you're doing. Yeah. And it's quite like, we've have over 200, almost 200, I think 30 uh, patrons right now. And it's like, I'm not instrumentalizing the Patreon account for like, you know, a tier system, like, you know, give me 20 bucks and I will, uh, you know, talk to you for 10 minutes or something like that. Like, uh, it's just like, give me $5, whatever you want, more or less, I'm happy. And then people have been really generous. And then I think that would only happen because it's based off the gift economy framing initially. Um, uh, yeah. 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 And Yang is a troublemaker. Um, yeah, so we do we do have tears in Rebel Wisdom. Like we've got different, and it's it's a constant conversation about like what is. So we actually got we had much higher tears, and we got rid of them because it just felt increasingly uncomfortable to be effectively kind of rational rationing our time. Like when we started doing it, and we kind of looked at what other podcasts were doing. It was kind of what everyone else was doing as well, and like it it was great in many ways because of the relationships that we built up. But, but then at some point it just felt kind of slightly, felt more and more uncomfortable to have these like really higher tiers and then a more intense kind of layered community. But at the same time, we, we're still trying to figure out Rebel Wisdom is a, is a business. Like we're, we're trying to kind of build a sustainable business in, a, in, in an environment where it's not that easy to do. And there's all of, like, there's never, yeah, the, the moral the moral dilemmas never really stop. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. it's kind of a like what one of the things that feels more appropriate, more and more appropriate is the is the online courses. It's kind of giving giving people a a kind of very curated experience for a certain kind of price. And that that the amount of time and energy and effort, and that's what we're trying to do with the community as well, is like trying to cater it, trying to trying to kind of build attention into it but it's it's difficult it's it's difficult it's a question that we're all kind of wrestling with i think yeah and i'll share this thought i think would be quite helpful is when this project first started it felt like or at least i was treating it like that it kind of maintained within the dunbar number you know like you know people came and go uh, went but it still helped that kind of that close-knit community feel but more recently it feels like it's exceeding that um and then there's a lot of expectations and then people are getting upset at me because i'm not responding to their email quick enough or you know i'm turning them down for a stoa session or something like that so there's like bad blood festering um and then it's making me want to withdraw be a little bit more cold uh and then it's it's the having more contractual relating or, or parameters is looking a lot more attractive if i'm going to continue with this especially if it's this is basically three jobs baked into one right now um so it's like the that that feel like that threshold is being crossed so either i kind of go scale down keep that magic alive or i transition this to something else in a different spirit it feels like that's the uh, choice point or crossroads that i'm facing with this particular project yeah and it's been interesting kind of hearing talk, talking with you recently about some of these dilemmas and about some of the dynamics and because because it, it show it shows that there's no like the model that you've come up doesn't that you've got doesn't necessarily get rid of those issues. It actually starts creating different ones in terms of people's expectations, in terms of people's kind of uh, feelings of ownership over something that you've created, or that sort of cloudiness as to whether it's 
yours or whether it's a community thing or like all of those and the thing and we've talked about like the the amount that people project onto community is astonishing like i've i've been amazed by it constantly um and wrestling with that and what yeah how we how we deal with that and how we um because i think the community means a lot to both of us but at the same time like managing people's expectations managing our own kind of ability of what we're able to provide and what we're what we're not is is a really tricky thing and i think we both as we kind of been talking about it realize that whatever model you use doesn't get rid of those problems right and i don't really like the term community i think it's overused um i, I like making a distinction between community versus a sense of community or i think community actually needs like structural reliance on other people um, and you can be a, live in an atomized community, but you know, there's kind of like a structural reliance, mostly in person. And then the sense community is like the feeling of being a part of a community, which is mostly online spaces. And, and, I'm, and, and I'm a pretty empathic person. I pick up on a lot of emotions, both individually and collectively. And I just feel the bubblings, the first glimpses of like the social trauma associated with certain spaces like this. And it's definitely above my pay grade to deal with that. Oh, we're, we're, we're pretty much at time. I didn't realize that time flew. Mm -hmm. um, so any, uh, I know you have to leave uh, shortly after the hour, David, any kind of uh, closing thoughts on the series or about the store or anything you'd like to leave us with? Just to say uh, um, to anyone here, you're welcome to reach out if you've got any questions. My, my thought with, so this came out of a conversation that Peter and I were having, um, and I sort of suggested whether the sort of broadcast skills that I built up over sort of 20 years of being a journalist might come in useful to people in this space. And that's really the spirit that I've kind of wanted to bring to these conversations. And I'd like to continue. So if, if anyone has any thoughts, any questions, I know uh, apologies to everyone who spent time writing questions into the document. Uh, we haven't had time to to get to them. But if, yeah, so so it's a, an invitation to. I'll put my email here, and if you want to kind of follow up, then yeah, I'd I'd love to 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 be in that position of kind of someone that people felt comfortable asking questions and being a kind of informal um, technical narrative source for for people in this space so if you have any thoughts questions that you want to follow up then please do so i'll make some <clears throat> some closing announcements in a moment but i just want to uh, send you deep love and gratitude my friend uh not only for these four sessions um but just for what you're doing uh in the world uh i think this space would not exist without rebel wisdom without your creativity without your effort there um, and just some of the people you brought together, like Jordan Peterson and Ken Wilber in, in you know, the same channel, it's never been seen before. Um, so without you, it's, it's needless to say that this space wouldn't exist. So deep love and gratitude to you, my friend. Um, and uh, on that note, uh, some uh, upcoming events uh, from the STOA. We're taking, taking a break now. I think Joe Edelman is going to have a last session um, soon. Uh, so you can check out the, the STOA.ca for that, uh, his social design club. Uh, and then we're going to take a break. Uh, and then the new year, uh, next session, January 4th, um, Robert Fritz, this famous kind of business consultant, is coming to talk about structural dynamics and the creative process. And then we have one of the leading scholars in collective intelligence uh, in an academic sense, which I don't think people in our scene really know about her, Anita uh, Woolley. Uh, she's going to have a one-on-one -on -one collective intelligence. That's January 6th. You can RSVP on the website there. Uh, so uh, the Stoet, or whatever you call it, David, <laughs> we'll be back in the new year, rebranded. All right, everyone. Much love. Thank you. Have a wonderful Happy New Year. New Year.